This episode of The Citadel Cafe is brought to you by listeners like you. Visit patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe to find out how you can become a patron and help make this show possible. This is the Citadel Cafe, episode number 413 for Wednesday, August 18th, 2021. My name is Joel Duggan, and the Citadel Cafe is where my friends and I hang out to talk about the geeky stuff that we are into. Joining me this week, Alistair McFly is back. You can find him at Alistair McFly on all of the social media that matters, as well as iMcFly on Twitter. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. How are you this morning? I don't know. (laughs) Well, now that we've established that we're both here, I should let everyone know that it's early. Uh, we don't normally record the Citadel Cafe first thing in the morning, but uh, Alistair was kind enough to fit this into his very busy day. And uh, I have to say, the more that I've done podcasting over the years, the more I like morning shows as opposed to late night shows. And oh, really? Yeah. I think it's because I like the checkbox of being able to record, edit, and post the show all in one day. And Mm. if I record the show and I'm finishing at around 10, the motivation to then edit and post that, which is another hour and a half of work, uh, is low. Uh, It's like, a "Mm, no, I'm going to do that in the morning. And then it ends up taking, uh, you know, a a lot longer. So having it done in the day, it's something that we do with the sponge chunks, actually. And now, obviously, with with the sponge chunks, I have uh, Johnny's help. He does the editing of the actual Mm. audio file. So. I can go have like lunch break and then while he's editing the show and then when he goes and does his stuff after he's done, uh, I, I can then do the posting and stuff like that later in the day. But Mm -hmm. it's, it's nice when you have, um, the day to do it, I think. And, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting though, because it's not something I get to do often. So even just the switch in timing in the recording kind of throws you off. Like the light in here is different, you know? I'm I'm sipping coffee, not water, you know, instead of uh or a beer, you know, with TCC like it just it's it's a different experience altogether. Yeah. But uh but yeah, I I don't know if I've ever asked you this. Are you a morning person? Like do you like to if you have carte blanche on your day, do you sleep in until like noon or are you up at like 6 or 7 o'clock? No, I I I would definitely be more the noon person. They, I did become a morning person for a brief period of time. And that's when I moved here because of the time zone difference. Suddenly it was like, oh, wow, this is 6 a.m.? Wow, I've not experienced this before. <laughs> and, uh, and then slowly began to acclimatize. It's like, oh, there's the midday wake up. <laughs> I, I tend to have, it's mainly because I, I have trouble winding down in the evening. And so I end up to, uh, still up very late. Or they'll be kind of like, this stuff I want to do. And if I go to bed, it means I'm not doing stuff. Um, I, I bring it upon myself, really. I, I tend to be a morning person. I don't, I won't sleep in until noon, but I will, I mean, I'll get sleep, I'll get extra sleep if I need it, but like nine o'clock is kind of like my, my tail end of when I have to get up. I think for me, it's that my apartment gets warm and then I just, I just not comfortable anymore and I have to get up. Um, for the longest time through university, which was a, an odd time to be able to do this, but I was up at 545 every day to, uh, okay. to go to the gym. It, just, it was a small, it was a small weight room, and when you've got a varsity football team that like dominates it from three thirty to five thirty when you're done classes, it was just so much easier to just get up, and get to the gym at six, and have the run of the place. Like basically, it was just me and maybe the swimmers, and uh, and yeah. you know that that made things a lot easier. But it also, I mean, I I very often had early morning classes, and I scheduled them at, at like early as well because um, I found getting those classes out of the way i'd rather have the rest of my day to like go get groceries or go do some cooking or whatever it is i need to do go to the library and do some homework whatever i much would rather do that later in the day than have to like go to a class at 2 30 in the middle of my day that like just chops everything up i tried to get all my classes kind of like over by noon or two if i could um so yeah i just i say all of my classes by the time i was in fourth year i really only had like two classes a day which was amazing (laughs) 
I, I must admit, though, that I am trying to get up earlier so that I can start doing more gym-related stuff. Just because I definitely have more energy throughout the day. Oh, yeah. Doing gym 100%. in the morning than yeah. if I was doing that later on. Um, but it's, it's still a work in progress. Uh, there, there are some successful mornings and, and many that aren't. I've been thinking and trying to get up uh, as a plan to go to the gym early. Uh, I know on the on the show I've talked about the last few weeks that I've been back at the at the local gym uh, with you know obviously masks and precautions and all that kind of stuff. But mm. uh, it's uh, it, as I got older, it's not as easy to to pay attention to that um, to that uh, that alarm at six o'clock. <laughs> the other thing is that for the longest time when I was doing that, like I said, I had classes or I was working at like an animation studio where I had like a nine to five. So like I had to be to work for nine. So if I wanted to fit the workout in, I'd had to get up at six and do it. I'm my own boss now and have been for years. So it's like, do I really want to get up at six? Mm, no, I'll just, I can, I can fit the workout in later. It still happens. It just tends to happen around noon. Um, the hard part about afternoon workouts right now is in summertime it's just really hot and so if any part of my workout yeah. is like a walk or a run outside then it's just it's often too hot to do it and i think that actually might be one of the reasons why i've not been able to get up uh, you and i were talking just before we started the show it has been very very hot and humid here in in the maritimes mm. and it makes it hard to sleep both of us have seen the wee hours of the morning despite going to bed at reasonable times and uh just the heat and humidity is just keeping us awake which means that all your best laid plans for a 6 a.m workout go out the window when you're still awake at 2 30 and you're just like well i can't there's i won't i won't be able to function if i get three and a half hours sleep and get up and work out so um <laughs> i just uh I, I don't need a lot of sleep six hours is usually good for me maybe seven or yeah. eight but uh anything less than that and i will definitely feel it for sure um, mm. but you know, all of that stuff about heat actually leads me into uh, a couple of things I wanted to point people towards. I won't get into the details cause there are a lot of details, but, uh, we'll have a link to a CBC article from August 9th about the, um, IPCC report, uh, the AR6 climate change 2001, the physical science basis report uh, talking about global warming, uh, the science behind it and what needs to change and what cannot be changed. This is the, the big takeaway from this is that essentially uh, already greenhouse gases levels in the atmosphere are high enough to guarantee climate disruption for decades, if not centuries, scientists warn in the report. Uh, and so that means that all of this talk about, you know, greenhouse gas reduction and carbon emission stuff and all the things that people are trying to do for alternate energy sources, uh, we need to put the pedal to the metal. And the report uh, is super long, but there are some slightly digestible chunks of it. Uh, specifically, you can find something to download that is for policymakers. So for example, uh, like we are in Canada coming up on a federal election, if uh, you want to educate yourself and uh, find out, you know, what policies these governing bodies sh should be, you know, considering, then you can read the 40 page report, which is much different than the 1300 page full report. But it basically gives like a summary of like, this is the kind of stuff that we have to address immediately. Because things like heat waves, powerful hurricanes, uh, weather extremes that are all happening right now are likely to become more severe and regular right so think don't think that oh we've had a bad fire season in california think it's fire season in california it will just repeat itself because of global warming and um there are some good news you know bits here and there saying that it's not too late and that we can still make a, a big difference and a lot of it focuses on government and big business because i mean i mean you and i can recycle and compost and reduce our you know carbon footprint to the best of our abilities you know people can buy electric cars um they can you know not have a lot of stuff shipped to them in separate packages you know they can do all kinds of things to try and reduce their carbon footprint but that is a drop in the bucket compared to industry which is the you know 80 percent of pollution around the mm -hmm. world and um i was reading an article, uh, another article on CBC um, about Nova Scotia, where we live, talking about uh, how old some of the homes are and how a combination of retrofits will be key to having Nova Scotia's net zero goal. 
I didn't realize this, but I, uh, apparently municipal buildings are some of the highest um, carbon producers in the province. It's not, you'd think oh, it would right. be traffic, right? You think it would be, yeah, it'd be cars and trucks and stuff. But I guess we're just not that dense of a population. We're in, in, a, in a larger city like Toronto. I mean, where municipal buildings would probably have a big part. Um, the traffic, the people is, is more of what's causing the issue. Um, but with Nova Scotia, it's actually building. So they're talking about, you know, working with communities and having a combination of like geothermal, wind, solar, uh, all these different kind of things that can be added to buildings. So it's not any one solution and it's not building new stuff. Cause when you're in a city as old as Halifax, and I understand that our European listeners are like, that's not old, but still, <laughs> um, but when you have, Relatively buildings, speaking. yeah, when you have buildings that are 150 plus years old, probably 200 years old in some places, uh, that if they're still standing, then being able to add things to them and, and do a combination of like, how do we get this building off of its oil burning furnace? You know, you have to add a number of things. One, like for example, solar probably isn't going to do it because you probably can't, um, you probably can't wire the building that way. Like it just, there's all these different challenges. And mm. the article goes on to say like this combination of retrofits, uh, is the way to go. And they referenced a project in the Netherlands called, uh, energy sprung. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, and that is a network in the Netherlands where they are um, using government cooperation to create net zero energy buildings on a large scale. In 2013, Eversprong um, brokered the Storm Versnelling deal with the Dutch building contractors and housing associations to refurbish over 100,000 homes to the NZE standard. Uh, two years later, they've evolved into a market initiative designed to take NZE to the next level. And in other countries, the name Energy Sprong is still in use. So Energy Sprong is something that you might start hearing around uh, other countries as they're attempting to uh, address a local housing crisis, which, I mean, through the pandemic, housing costs in Canada have gone through the roof. And more public housing, more low-income housing is needed. And one of the things that the governments are looking at doing is partnering with energy companies to then create net zero. So rather than just throwing up a bunch of duplexes that work the same way they always have, you know, they're going to attempt to have these net zero homes where they're built with solar roofs. They've got, you know, energy efficient, you know, windows and doors and all these different things to try and create a low impact while still sustaining housing for people. And uh, anyway, really interesting read. Uh, I'm becoming more and more of a nerd about some of the alternative energies. And um, I used to really be really into architecture. So knowing how new buildings and new constructions can then very easily adopt things that uh, create alternate energy or at least uh, net zero energy buildings is really interesting to me. So if it's, if it's interesting to you, we'll have the link to both CBC articles as well as the IPCC report on the show notes this week very productive thing to nerd about as well yeah i think so too uh, i'm tempted i i don't know if it's ever going to happen because i don't have the time i don't think but i've been looking to try and see if i can get another uh podcast off the ground that focuses more on environment environmental science and understanding that more in kind of like in oh, a neat. in a selfish way to, to like force myself to really learn a lot more about it um, mm. because we've covered a, a number of stories on the Citadel Cafe in the last year, things like the, the tulip windmill, um, from a couple of weeks ago, like stuff like that. I'd like to have more of that. So not necessarily getting into like the deep science conversations all the time, cause I'm not a scientist, but, um, I'd like to talk to some people who are, I think that would be really, really cool. And, uh, it's something that I've become more passionate about. Certainly something that swings my vote, depending on how things go with, you know, federal and provincial elections. But I think the... Um, the problem that I usually face is just time, you know, finding the time of the day to do that kind of thing. Um, but also like uh, lessons learned to, to try and find a good, you know, par podcasting partner for that, because, uh, I'm not an expert and I would want to, I would want to be there with someone that is an expert, you know? So what's new with you, man? Uh, I've booked a holiday and I'm very excited because I, I, I have booked about a week off. And I am going to go to Cape Breton for the first time. Excellent. 
I have been wanting to go there for the last several years after all the recommendations that people have given me to but um i've had to always rely on other people up until now and one year uh, a friend was sick uh the next year uh my other friend broke her arm um and then they ended up with pets that were too young to be left for too long because they she just got them so there's all these kind of things that have cropped up that have gotten in the way but now i have a car <laughs> and i can go <laughs> And it's like, I don't have to rely on other people. This is all about me now, and I'm going to go there and stuff. And so uh, I've been looking around, and it's, um, uh, I, I don't know where I'm staying yet. I have no idea where I'm staying. I still need to sort out accommodation. Uh, I, I, I did say to somebody, though, that if I can't find, like, a bed and breakfast, like, I'll probably just buy a cheap tent and camp. And they're like, oh, you don't want to do that. I'm mm-hmm. like, what, what, why? You know, they're, they're coyotes. Mm-hmm. There's that, what now? <laughs> you know, because... <I>, <laughs> Like when I came to Canada, I found out that there's ticks, which I didn't even know existed. I thought the ticks were just like a superhero, but I mean, it makes sense that he's named after something real, like Spider Man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then I found out that there's coyotes that will maul my face in the middle of the night. I'm like, like, why is everything in Canada try to kill you? Makes you stronger. <laughs> That's why we're so resilient. It's it's never the stuff that's highlighted on the brochure. Like, <laughs> is, is, I know that they have moose there, and I really want to see a moose. I also know that those are dangerous, so I have to keep my distance. You, you don't want um, to see a moose in the wild. You you might want to see a statue of a moose, so you might want to run into a moose maybe uh, at a wildlife park, but you do not want to see a moose yeah, on your they, own. They do have the, the Cape Breton Highlands National Park, and I want to go there, and apparently they have some, some moose there, so I do want to check that out mm-hmm. for, for, from the, the safety, because yes, I, I, I know they can can derail a train they are <laughs> yeah they are very very strong massive creatures is, is there anything else that you're aware of that i need to worry about i know that depending on how deep into the woods you get in nova scotia that there are some i want to say black bears but i don't believe black bears have made it across the causeway to cape breton which is why i think the coyote population is a problem um, I could be very wrong on that. Anybody that's local that knows, <laughs> please let me know. But yeah, I've never heard of coyotes uh, making a huge prob- uh, noise in- on mainland Nova Scotia, but I've I, I've certainly heard about black bears and then vice versa. I don't often hear about black bears in Cape Breton. I'm sure there probably are some. Um, the thing is, like when you get up into the highlands, like it's it might not be worth their travel time to come down into the populated areas, so you just might not see right. um, Cape Breton being much more spar- sparsely populated uh, than... Yeah. Um, than the mainland um yeah. i have a recommendation and actually something that you can oh. pop by and borrow before you uh go up depending on what your activities are going to be uh i have the uh hiker's guide to nova scotia oh oh yes if uh, I, I would be more than happy to yeah it's a little that. pocket book and i'm trying to find the name of it right now frantically on google but i don't remember it it's on my bookshelf that's too far away to reach right now but if i can <laughs> think of it before the end of the show i'll, I'll let you know but, but yeah it's like well, a little you. it's a little four by six book that just fits in your backpack and uh I, I mean i don't know how much hiking you're planning on doing but you'd certainly be able to get kind of like the lowdown on some of the national parks and some of the trails that you might be able to walk that would mm. be very accessible and like well maintained and all that kind of stuff that's excellent. Yeah, because I want to go to the Cabot Trail, which is the main one mm-hmm. that, uh, that people yep. mentioned. Uh, I've been told to try the Skyline Trail as well. Uh, and then a couple of other places to hit, like Ingerdish Beach and the Fortress of Lewisburg, uh, which is a national historic site. And, um, I was, and I'm, I'm going to apologize ahead of time, but I've also been recommended to go to Lick a Chick, which is the name of a chicken chain. Uh, of restaurants, A and K Liquor Chick, so to, <laughs> to to clear the bar that this is a chicken restaurant, uh, but apparently they are very very good. Uh, in addition to having a whimsical name, I'm realizing now that I may have the hiking trails of mainland Nova Scotia. I'll double check. It looks like there might be a separate book for Cape Breton. Okay, but uh, I'll let you know. Cool, thank you. They're great little books, actually. If anybody uh, wants to look them up. Um, I don't know if they've got other regions, like whether parts of Canada, parts of the U.S. might also have other books, but uh, it's written by Michael Haynes. And usually these people travel around and do a lot of uh, a lot of stuff. There's one about waterfalls. Uh, looks like there is one about Cape Breton. So if anything, if nothing else, I'll send you a link. It was a cheap book. It was like 20 bucks at chapters. So if you're looking at adding that to the repertoire, then I will let you know. 
Moving on to what we have been watching this week, both Alistair and I have watched What If on Disney+, Plus, which is the latest in the Marvel, we'll say cinematic universe, but it's actually a cinematic uh, alternate universe. And I guess cinematic is also a bit of a misnomer too because it's a <laughs> cartoon on Disney+. Plus. But everything that they do just tends to tie into one another. Like there was a series about Loki that ties into everything. So this is like another one of these sidebar series uh, that... Uh, was very well received by me. What was your first impression of What If? Uh, for the most part, I really liked it as well. And it's got me really excited about what what they're going to do with the show. I haven't, I purposely haven't looked into what's coming next. And I think that going forward, like I, I almost kind of don't want to know the order that things will be coming out. I, I feel like it'll be quite a nice surprise each week. Mm. as to to where they're going with it but yeah uh, overall i liked it a couple of uh, of things that i wasn't so keen on but uh but mostly very positive so let's start start with the nitpicks what what was it that you thought was a little bit off the the first minor nitpick and this is this is getting really nitpicky uh they really love to hammer home that he's steve rogers the um like it's very rare that they call him steve it's always steve rogers throughout the entire thing and it it just seems a bit too forceful um but I, overall I, I know i'm a terrible person for saying this um but when steve is shot towards the beginning i feel that it would have been better had he actually died at that moment i thought he was going to yeah and I, it was almost the the fact that he survived like there, there were things that i i did love about the fact that he was there uh, you know that um there's a really nice conversation that the that uh, he and Peggy are having by the window, and he's talking about being the skinny kid from Brooklyn, and she's obviously realizing that she's really strong and everything. And there's just the the line that resonates a lot with uh, the stuff that Tony Stark has said with Spider Man, which is that the suit is nothing without the man inside. And um, and I really like that. Peggy's connection with him is still strong, even though their roles are reversed. Like it hasn't affected their relationship in a way. That was a nice through line that they did. Um, and for people, for people that don't know, we should one give some spoiler warnings. But also, I mean, it's not a huge spoiler because they did. It, you're not going to be surprised by I think by any of the story beats. But the yeah. moments, the moments in the show are the things that you don't want to spoil. So if you're worried about it, then just heads up. But also to set this up, um, what if is a series where the watcher takes a look at, at what could have happened if a certain event in the Marvel Universe or a person in the Marvel Universe went a different direction. So what if instead of Steve Rogers becoming Captain America, Peggy became Captain Carter? So she gets the super soldier serum. She becomes uh, the, the, the Captain America role and Steve Rogers never changes. He's still that skinny kid from Brooklyn and yeah. and then and then they have to fight and and do things in World War II, uh, and fight the Red Skull and all that kind of stuff. So it um it's an alternate history or alternate universe as to what could have happened, and uh, and they explore that and they do it in an animated form. It's a cartoon. So I feel like you have to have really seen the movie to really get it. Like they oh for they, sure, and, and, and it is designed for that. You know, I don't think you could come into this without having seen the film that they're referencing, um, but. The story beats are, I think, too similar. It just seems to just follow um, pretty much the entire movie just with a, a couple of things swapped around. I, I think there wasn't as much variety there as I was expecting there to be. And yeah. The one, the one big thing that they did have that was different, which was the Hydra Stomper, um, I also wasn't so... Like, I thought the idea of the Hydra Stomper was well executed in terms of how it's utilized but to me that always feels like even though stark made it it's that's more of a tony invention to me than something his dad would have come up with yeah i i the, i think what they were trying to do was give a nod to the original iron man film where tony builds the first mark yeah. one iron man suit that gets him out of the mm. cave you know, because yeah. the, the, the it's very similar to that. Yeah, yeah, the Hydra Stomper kind of looks like that. It's also, I would imagine, a, a nod um, from anyone that's worked in animation for any number of years uh, has seen the Iron Giant, and 
<laughs> it definitely has some Iron Giant moments to it, right up to like yeah. when Peggy Carter as Captain Carter is riding the Hydra Stomper like an like a surfboard in the air. Like it's because the thing flies. It's it's a it's a it's a giant mech suit that that Steve drives and uh, it flies. And Peggy jumps on his back and uses it as like transportation and boost jumps and all kinds of stuff. And uh, yeah, it's I I agree with you in that. The story beats are definitely one-to-one in a lot of ways where they could have gone a little bit sideways. But I think yeah. one of the things they, they want to explore in the What If series, and this is just my impressions from the first episode, is that when something switches and the switch is it's Peggy, not Steve, that's Captain, uh, then they focus on that change. And I yeah. think by keeping everything else the same it does help focus on those characters as opposed to how would this entire world be different? And the drawback there is that you have to have seen Captain America, the first Avenger to appreciate all these story beats, but then also you're not bored, but you kind of know what happens next. Right. And because you realize that they're not deviating that much at all from the original plot and events, then you're like, okay, well, now I kind of know how this all ends. So it's just a matter of like, not not what happens, but how they handle the thing. And I think yeah. that's why that Steve Rogers didn't die. Well, I mean, two reasons. One, they wanted him They wanted him in the Hydra Stomper uh, in order yeah. to um, have that relationship between Steve and Peggy develop the same way that it did in the um, prime, you know, Marvel Universe, um, have it develop over the course of World War II. Uh, only to have her then be separated from him for 70 years. And you can't do that if he's dead. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons. The other thing is I think that these universe peaks, these looks into what if, I think are supposed to focus on like, what if just one thing changed? And if they, mm. if too many things start changing, then they're, it's not an alternate universe. It's just a completely different story, right? It's just all the things are different. And so I think that's probably where they were going with it. I think this also depends on how they're approaching it. And I'm not sure, based on the dialogue that the Watcher provides, especially at the end, I don't know if this is um, what if happening in several different alternate realities or if Peggy becoming Captain Carter is a linchpin that sets off a chain of events. Oh. in a single alternative universe that i'm not sure how they're doing it so this could also just be a way to ease us into what this new alternate universe looks like the second episode is out now so we'll find out soon enough uh because mm. you've been saying that you don't want to know i won't tell you um i just went to go get the links for the show uh and noticed that the new episode was out i don't know when it's coming out i guess it's probably wednesdays would be my guess They've been a okay. pretty the Disney Plus has been either Wednesdays or Fridays has been their their jam as far as yeah. release dates go. So it was probably like you know midnight you know, like this first thing this morning. Um, but I, I mean I'm already interested to see where it goes. Um, yeah. Because <laughs> I mean here's the thing: the production quality is really good, really good. If you've seen yes. any promotional art, it is that but moving. Uh, they've used <laughs> uh, CG characters and designs to do like a cell shaded sort of vibe uh, to everything. It's not all black line, like it's still very round, um, but they've got this graphical high contrast way of shading everything so that it looks more like a traditional cartoon. And because they do that, they are able to also bring in um, stylistic design choices like backgrounds. Mm. Uh, There's a point where like, Peggy punches somebody and the whole background is like a union Jack. Like it's just, it's, they do some really (laughs) cool, like comic book splash pages that really sell it uh, as something that don't take it too seriously. It is a cartoon. We're going to have some fun with it. This is going to feel like a 1940s war promotional video at some points. Like they do a really good job with the music choices. Like they really, there's a, they really kind of, hammer it home that like we're going to have some fun with this we hope you will too and the only thing about the animation which is something i normally bring up is that there are a number of places where the lip sync was a little bit off 
and that's limited to probably how the models are made. And I, I feel like they could have done some better jobs in the close-up shots of, of having more, just more articulation with the lip sync and have it being a little bit more um, traditional looking. The thing that really struck me, pardon the pun, were the action poses that they put Captain Carter in. Like every oh, yeah. superhero pose that you can imagine from a comic book, <laughs> they managed to to put her in. And it's basically like pose to pose animation. If anybody's familiar with that, it just goes from like really good extreme to a really good extreme. If you've seen Spider-Man enter the Spider-Verse, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And mm. this was no different. Like they they gave her some powerful moves and some really iconic like uh, Wonder Woman-esque kind of like poses and things. And it it was just fantastic to see the animation and the action and the way that they portray it all, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like they've put her in a role forcefully. It really matches her strong personality. Yeah. Uh, they do a good job of, well, we, we all remember what happened with Steve uh, when he turned into Captain America, he went from the skinny kid from Brooklyn to uh, Chris Evans, who had lifted weights for months and months and months. <laughs> and, and like, he, he's a big dude now. And, mm. um, or at least he was when they did the Avengers. Uh, and Peggy Carter is already a tall person. Like she, in, in the movie, she's taller than skinny Steve Rogers. Like she's, I would say, you know, above average for a female height. Uh, and, uh, and then when she gets the fem- when she gets the super soldier ser- serum, she's huge. She's a mm. head taller than all the men in the rest of the, in the rest of the, the series. And it's great. And they do it in a way that she still looks feminine like she's still wearing outfits from the 40s uh she in uniform obviously she's got her uniform but she still yeah. has a little bit of curve to her you know like they, they've drawn her like like the modern versions of she hulk not the ones where she hulk looks like a bodybuilder but like the the modern versions of she hulk where she looks like she's just a very strong individual and yeah man did they just nailed it in terms of the uh, visual the character appeal the character power and then also with the voice acting from Haley Atwell and the uh, the writing decisions of how much she's enjoying it, like you you have, the, I mean, you think about this. She's a woman in the military in the forties, you know, uh, surrounded by men who don't take her seriously. She's smart yeah. as a whip, strong willed, and now physically stronger than everybody else, including the men. And mm. she can body slam trucks like. And she just tickled pink by it. It's hilarious. In in like in the best way. Like you're laughing at the same time you're going, yeah, because that was that was yeah. a truck full of Nazis that she just threw over a bridge. Like it's just it's so good. She, she, uh, she's a woman who does not know her own strength and is just excited to discover yeah. <laughs> exactly how much. Yeah. And th- those fight sequences are slick. Like it, when you think of how uh she's throwing the shield. Um, oh, how man. they've done that in the movie, like it's just there feels like there's even more power to it when she's throwing it. Uh, yeah, in this, yeah the, yeah, the animation on it and the the way that she hits people because they they pause the frame. Like when when she smacks somebody and knocks them out with a shield, as soon as she gets through that follow through and the guy's like bent over sideways with like teeth flying, she's just there's this kind of like snapshot like <laughs> Kodak moment, you know, <laughs> just bang, yeah. kicks and, him in the knee, yeah, oh, smashes his knee. There, and stuff. There's but, a yeah. there, there is a moment again, spoilers, where this giant nazi gets gets out of the truck and is like oh fräulein i'm going to wipe the floor with you and she basically punches him in the knee punches him in the face and then punches him in the nuts and the guy goes down like a train like just you know he doesn't even get a punch in it was so funny and even when she does that like there's a point where she uses the shield and she like i'm not sure how you want to call it she like shoulder blocks a truck and flips it over herself and she's just like that was amazing. I want to do that again. <laughs> and though she does it again, like they do it twice because like even the animators are like, that was fantastic. We have to do that again. And it just, it was, it's so earnest in that way that I, I really, really enjoyed yeah. it. Um, my, sorry, go ahead. My, my immediate thought when I first started watching this, um, when it came to the animation, just being struck by just the cell shading and especially all of this, this actual sequence, 
is that it has come such a long way since Neil Patrick Harris's Spider-Man series, which was uh, which is the 3D animated one that was made by Mainframe Entertainment, right? The Canadian studio who made Reboot, and that Spider-Man series was all that kind of cell shading. And I just immediately went back to that and just thinking just how much uh, better this has become over the years and stuff. And it's just, I have never seen cell shading look this good before. Yeah. Especially it, with all the action that they've thrown in. They've really got a lot going for it, which is, is fantastic. The, um, the thing that I, the first thought that I had after finishing the series was dear Kevin Smith, this is how this is how you do it. This is how you write and portray a powerful female lead that can kick ass, who has personal struggles, see woman in the 40s in the military, and can be emotional, compassionate, and vulnerable, her love for Steve, without it being a crutch. Mm. Like she's identifiable, you have some sympathy for her, you are rooting for her the entire time. Uh she's appealing, she has empathy and compassion she has no time for idiots like there's all of these things that go from one extreme to the next in her personality and how she handles herself in the show and it all works properly because mm. uh i feel like they've just had an understanding of what peggy carter means to the marvel universe like what she is and if anything we've not seen enough of peggy carter uh in in the marvel universe i really enjoyed agent carter when it was on tv and it's too bad that it didn't last but um i would have liked to have seen some other things you know with peggy in it uh she's almost like yeah she's if you look at the films she's she's just in the one like she's almost a myth you know in terms of the 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 steve rogers you know uh history she she's just there for like select scenes, like where she's on a hospital bed or right, you know, like or later just on, yeah, like just, dance and stuff. Yeah. yeah, so like she she pops up briefly, but but yeah, it's, there's never the focus. There's never like this is her there. She's she's really there just to serve where Steve's at. Mm -hmm. really. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I'm blown away by it. I thought it was fantastic. I'm on board to watch the rest of the series. Any mm. small nitpicks I have with like animation lip sync or or you know um repetitive story uh, and we'll see how often they do that i i think like you said they might not do that with every one we might see some different takes here and there um but i'm i'm on board like i'm already a, a disney plus subscriber so i will continue to watch uh, and see where it goes it was, it was amazing also just to see how many voice actors had returned which could not have yes. been easy to schedule for no. it. and uh you know props to josh keaton who stepped into the role of steve rogers because uh, Chris Evans what, you know, wasn't able to come back for whatever reason, either couldn't or or didn't want to. Um, but I, I I did love how uh, Josh posted on Twitter saying that uh, he knows how particular people can be about changes. And he's like, I had some absolutely huge shoes to step into. Luckily, they were a little skinnier in this version. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought it was a really nice touch. But I I thought you did brilliantly, and it was uh, uh and I can't wait to see more of uh of jeffy wright as the watcher i thought he was incredible too yes yeah i i really enjoyed jeffrey wright anyway um i yeah. i kind of wonder and i and i don't know this is pure speculation it could have gone out one of two ways either they couldn't afford chris evans because of his you know current stature now in hollywood mm. which might be a possibility i would imagine he would have wanted to do it or they decided not to cast him on purpose so as to shine the light stronger on Peggy. That that's 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 a I fair don't point. Know. Yeah. Because because Evans um they do a little falsetto with his voice in the in the films for skinny Steve. Uh he does yeah. he, he has more of a robust kind of like, you know, I don't like bullies kind of stuff. And I feel like mm. that kind of presence vocally might have made skinny Steve Rogers seem a little bit like you know chris evans voice in the skinny kid and so i'm wondering if they went that road on purpose um yeah. i don't think it took away from it i actually spent a good chunk of the the half an hour trying to decide if it was chris evans or not so yeah it's a very very good likeness it's a very good yeah. performance from him for yeah. sure. so what else have you been watching my friend i was recommended a documentary which is absolutely fantastic called life after the navigator 
It's it's a documentary about the film uh, Flight of the Navigator. One of my favorites. Yeah, it, it was it was recommended in a group chat where a friend of mine uh, sort of put it. Has anybody seen Life After the Navigator? He says uh, no spoilers for it, but holy shit, the stuff that happened to the kid from that movie, and I was that kind of piqued my interest. I was like, okay, what 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 happened then? Um, and it's a a documentary that took two years for them to make. And it opens kind of giving you a little teaser as to what did happen to Joel Kramer, who, who was the, the child from that film, um, showing that he got arrested by the RCMP in Canada for a bank robbery at a Scotiabank in BC. Wow. Yes. And it's, it's like, what? Um, and that that's not the only time he's been arrested either. So there's been this whole kind of thing. And uh, one of the actors, I think it was the actor who played his dad, kind of says, you know, it's not a question of like what happened, but like how, 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 how did it happen? You know, and, um, and it's very good. But it's also um, a very well-balanced documentary. It's not all... F- so uh, focusing solely on Joel Kramer, it does talk about uh, the history of the film and the production. There's a lot of involvement from the rest of the cast and crew uh, as a sort of sideline to all of, of that stuff as well. And some of the things that I didn't even know uh, was that the puppeteers for Max, which is the big robot thing in the, in the ship, was puppeted by the guys who puppeted Johnny Five from Short Circuit. Oh, and right one on. of them, one of them provided the voice for Johnny Five, so that was really kind of neat. And they talk about some of the reflection mapping visual effects that they did for the ship as well, which was a first in in film, and that inspired James Cameron and helped lay the groundwork for the T one thousand in Terminator Two. So there's no a kidding. lot of these little things that come out. Um, and if you if you like the visual effects, there's actually a really good... I don't know if you've ever heard of Captain Disillusion before. No. But he does a, a series on YouTube called VFX Cool, where he breaks down a lot of special effects shots. Uh, he also debunks a lot of um, videos that are on online and just kind of goes, well, yeah, it wouldn't work because this is how it's done as a visual effect and it's fake. And he did a massive documentary as a passion project on all the special effects of Flight of the Navigator. So uh, that's really worth checking out as well, uh, if, you, if you want to see how a lot of the, the stuff was done. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just a very, very good movie. It talks a lot about child actors and uh, the fact that after he did this film, Disney were wanting him for more, and the mother declined because the, the Brat Pack, as she called them, Uh, We're in a lot of trouble in the way that a lot of child actors would be. So she tried to keep him out of that. And he still ended up in a lot of trouble anyway. Yeah. Uh, And and it goes into how this can affect children. Uh, Veronica Cartwright, who played his mother and also was Lambert in the Alien series, I had no idea she was a child actor. Uh, One of the most successful ones. Yeah. Uh, They they show a few clips from from stuff that she'd done. I had had no idea. Uh, But for something that goes through some really uh, tumultuous times and just that kind of nature, it's surprisingly feel good. And there's a lot of strong messages of, of positivity and hope. And so I, I don't really want to spoil things too much, but uh, it is definitely worth checking out. They've, it's produced by a company called Life After Movies. They've also done one called Life After Flash, which is about the uh, the Flash Gordon movie. And they're also in production for one called Life After Atreyu, which is one that they're doing on the oh, Never Ending wow. Story. I definitely, yeah, so I definitely want to check those out as well. I was really, really impressed with this. And so uh, Life After Flash, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go give a watch as well. Uh, it's on a platform called Tubi, which I've heard of before, but never used. Okay. I don't know if you're familiar with it at all. No, I'm not. I, um, it's... It's a free streaming platform. They also have Trek Nation, which is a documentary uh, with uh, Gene Roddenberry's son. But it's it's all ad based. So when you're mm. watching, there are ads in the middle. Um, well, but I, I watch I, YouTube. I'm used to that. Yeah, it, it it didn't bother me too much. They they aren't too frequent. They, I think there's like 
somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes between commercials. So. That's not bad. No, no, it's 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 decent, so it's worth watching. But uh, but yeah, highly highly recommend uh, this this documentary, Life After the Navigator. The two things that I remember from Flight of the Navigator were that Paul Rubens, Pee Wee Herman voiced Max, yep. the robot mm. ship thing, and I believe it was my introduction as a young man to the Beach Boys. <laughs> I think it was for me as well. I think that's the first time I've ever yeah. heard them. And I went on a, t like, I listened to a lot of the Beach Boys when I was a kid for whatever reason. That just, it was music I thought was fun. And I, I, I remember owning cassettes of Beach Boys. Um, yeah. That and the movie Cocktail, I think, later on uh, also, yes. also yeah. influenced that. But yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it, I remember really liking it, but it's been one of those movies that I've been scared to go back and watch as an adult because <laughs> you're just like, how bad is this going to be? <laughs> and yeah, I just, I, when I, when I was that young, I was a big Jim Henson fan. I liked the Muppets. I liked anything yep. creative like that, you know, Lego, um, all that, those kind of things. Um, uh, so anything that had that kind of like Star Wars practical puppet sort of thing, I was all on board for, cause I would have been seven when this came out. And, mm. uh, so yeah, like it was. I remember being very high up. It it, re, it reminds me of something like I would have seen probably like as a birthday party sort of deal. You know, you get a couple of friends and you oh, go to yeah. the movies. Like yeah. that's probably what, how I saw it. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, I, I just, there's a certain number of movies like that that I haven't gone back to watch. And actually one that I have, which is why that I, I perked up about the never ending story is that that is currently on Netflix. You can watch that film if you haven't seen it, folks. And uh, it holds up. It's still a little hokey 80s, you know, family adventure, but it is not without its um, serious moments. And mm. and I think that if you can get past some of the rough special effects from the 80s, then uh, the never ending story is definitely worth a watch. And I mean, I think probably has a resurgence in popularity since the last season of Stranger Things, but it uh, it holds up. 100 percent. it is it's not something that i watched as a kid and then watched as, a, as an adult and rolled my eyes like I, was, I actually quite enjoyed my my second watch through and if anything like especially watching the captain dissolution video uh i th even though i've kind of done the same as yourself where i haven't gone back to watch flight of the navigator for very similar reasons watching uh the vfx cool video really gave me more appreciation of the groundbreaking effects that they had back then Right. And some of the ways that they pulled stuff off, which uh, I never would have thought. Uh, they've got some very creative practical effects that are just like, oh, that's really simple and obviously wouldn't have cost them much to do at all. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really awesome. And they, they also go into the casting of Paul Rubin and how they came to that voice. And they also talk about the Beach Boys music choices in there as well. <laughs> so I, th I, think, uh, <laughs> I think you'll get a big kick out of that too. If you are interested in video games, then I have a recommendation before we move on, and uh, that is Hades, which is now available from Supergiant Games on Xbox Game Pass. I have been playing mm. this for a few days now. It came out on the 13th of August, uh, included obviously in my Xbox Game Pass, so all I had to do was download it. And uh, I have to say, I am not normally a roguelike like uh, video game person I find them I don't find the super hard video games rewarding I tend to get very frustrated quickly uh, mm. but this is a very heavy on the story and heavy on the beautiful art direction and design uh, realm of rogue likes uh, something that I think um, people that are familiar with super giant games would be uh, used to with um, other titles like transistor and bastion uh, I didn't realize Hades was as old as 2018. I thought it was a lot more recent than that. Um, but it uh, it's set in the underworld in Greek mythology. So you play Prince Zagreus, the son of Hades, uh, who was, of course, lord of the underworld in Greek mythology. And uh, mm -hmm. you don't like it there in Tartarus. So sort of like a teenager fed up with home, you're running away and you're attempting to escape. <laughs> And the way that the underworld is designed is that if you go there as a dead person from the world to, you know, live, not live, but to reside forever, uh, if you decide that you don't like it there and you want to leave, it's just like this ever-changing sequence of rooms 
which lends itself very well to a dungeon crawler slash roguelike. So as you proceed from room to room, they're usually different. They'll change layouts. After a, a number of hours, you start to recognize a couple, a couple of similar layouts, but they change the set dressing. They change the angle, which is nice. Uh, so you don't always feel like you're running through the exact same seven rooms. Uh, and the order in which they appear is also um, random. So that keeps the play fresh. The, so is it kind of like an endless hell? Effectively? Yeah, that's precisely what it is. Uh, right. And there's demons and all these basically, um, all these bad people that have died and gone to, to you know, to live with Hades and they, uh, not live with Hades, but to reside in Tartarus. Uh, I get confused sometimes with Hades, the God and Hades, the realm. Like the realm of Hades is often referred to as like, you know, the like hell but it's mm. it's the underworld it's it's the afterlife it's not necessarily hades is a person not a place anyway right. the uh the gameplay is is much like most dungeon crawlers you've got like a dash attack you've got uh a number of uh weapons you can choose from if you like ranged stuff you can get a spear or sword a shield that kind of thing and then the neat thing about it is that as you progress you collect a bunch of different resources uh darkness is one gems is another coins is a third and you can use these resources at different points uh if you run into uh charon the the boatman the ferryman that ferries souls across the river Styx into the underworld um then you can pay him for power-ups and heal-ups and like get extra life that kind of thing or you can later on buy boons from the gods uh these boons are something that will also just appear to you um whenever you start the level or um, choose the next room that might have one in it and they are messages from the olympian god so zeus Ares, artemis dionysus they all have different power-ups to offer you because you're related uh hades and zeus are brothers therefore you are zeus's nephew and if you're trying to leave the realm of hades zeus is like hey nephew i'm sorry you're not happy there let me give you a hand uh, and the dialogue is all kind of tongue in cheek like that. It's, uh, really, really well done. And what happens is you'll get this, uh, icon in the middle of the screen and it'll have a certain symbol on it, glass of wine for Dionysus, a shield for Artemis, uh, a lightning bolt for Zeus. And so, you know, what God you're about to talk to. And it's essentially like email, uh, but he has to recite like an incantation. So Zagreus will say in the name of Hades, I accept this message. And then. Zeus will appear and say, well, hello, young Zagreus. It looks like you're having some trouble with this blah, 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 blah. And he just kind of goes on and, and it's all voice acted. You can read it on screen, but it's all wonderfully voice acted. And I kid you not, dude, <laughs> every time I interact with a god or a character in this in this game, which I've done a number of times, they say something different. Like, it oh, nice. is, oh man, the depth and cleverness to the writing in this game is really what keeps it going uh overall it has like an anime comic book kind of vibe to it uh you of course and the and the environment you play in are all cg very similar to how we described um agent carter um yeah but when a god is speaking to you similar to like a jrpg sort of situation where you used to have like a little pixel art sprite on screen but then when you talk to the character it's a full anime drawing that pops up on screen with a text balloon same idea here uh you do encounter hades in the game and he is a cg model but he's kind of like behind the desk kind of like a big boss you know, like in, mm. in, a, in a high-rise building uh doing a lot of paperwork such as his plight in life apparently uh <laughs> there's a lot of humor in the game and and so when he pops up on screen though he's this beautiful uh colorful hand-drawn uh black and white ink like bright beautiful colors like all these really cool aesthetic choices made and it works because they're gods so i'm so glad that it's this beautiful still drawing rather than a crassly animated cg model that you know would have to be pixar level for people not to sneer at it and instead mm. it works on two levels um they're not animated save for like maybe fire burning or a blink here and there but because they're gods uh, especially the olympians they're not physically there with you so the idea is that they're communicating to you by appearing to you in your head or you know essentially just kind of like sending you a message they're not standing in front of you so there's no need to have them cg animated and acting and stuff 
Yeah, it's just kind of like like you say, receiving an email and you're just thinking of the... You're just visualizing the person that sent it to you. Although yeah. you don't have to, to loudly announce, I accept this email. Yes, you do, but you do every time. And every time Zachary <laughs> says it, it's different. You know, like I, I, there, I might have heard the same thing like once or twice, but like especially as you meet different gods, he absolutely has a different reaction. Oh, that's cool. For example, he's basically trying to escape Tartarus by beating the snot out of all these demons, which is what the gameplay is. And then eventually you get a message from Ares, the god of war. And Zagreus is just like, oh man, I wonder when this guy was going to show up. Like you're being violent and it's taken this long for Ares to show up. So you're like, huh, it took long enough. Like it's, it's really, really intricate. I, if you play it, turn the music down a little bit, turn the effects down nearly to half and crank the voice acting because you really need to hear all of the subtleties in the delivery. It's so good. So, so good. I hadn't seen nor heard of this game until you mentioned it and saying, like, you know, this is one of the things I want to talk about. And we, you, you had sent me the link and I, I watched the gameplay trailer um, as we were talking sort of, uh, before we started recording the show. And I just remember just being blown away just by how bright and colorful everything is. It's all the sort of 2D cell shaded animation. I think I even said like, well, that's going to be the theme of the day. <laughs> Because yeah. it's it's really, really well done. I love just the lighting effects that they have in the floor for a lot of stuff. It seems that, like a lot of floors are just opened up and there's either pools of lava or there's crevices of light. And it's uh, and, and just all the just the visual style is really, really neat. And they also really hammer home the music too on, on the soundtrack. And the soundtrack sounds amazing. Very cool rock music. And uh, you were also uh, just briefly explaining to me about uh, that's that's a, a common part of their games. Bastion and the soundtrack to Bastion especially. I've heard it before, uh, but all of their games apparently have very, very good music. And really, from what I can see, all of their games have very unique, uh, interesting uh, character design and art direction as well. So the art mm. team and the music team at Supergiant Games are just really knocking it out of the park uh i the thing that i do find frustrating about it so far is the gameplay um not that it's bad it's just that i'm bad at it if that makes any sense uh, <laughs> yeah i've gotten to the final boss for tartarus like four or five times now and i just i just know that if i go in there with anything less than like three quarters health i'm just not going to make it like it's just as best as i try i just can't seem to escape it uh the game hits hard it's not like you have you know five hit points of damage when a bad guy hits you it's more like 30 so it's mm. if you've ever played any of those games where it's like two hits you're dead you know or uh, and if you're dead that's it you start over again you don't start at the boss over again you start at the beginning of all of it over again so you have to oh, clear wow. you have to clear more rooms and the 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 rng behind that is that Sometimes you're presented with a choice. When you're finished one room, you collect your reward and then you can go either to door one or door two. And they'll have symbols on them. And the doors that, that represent uh, boons from the gods will have that god symbol. Like a lightning bolt means that if you go into that room and you win, you'll get a new boon from Zeus. And Zeus comes down and says, hey, uh, I need to give you a hand here. Choose one of these. And it's like, add lightning damage to your sword or uh, increase the frequency of your dash or uh, when you dash, you'll actually zap nearby enemies with lightning, like that kind of stuff. And each god has a different kind of um, deal. Uh, Aphrodite, the god of love, will um, curse nearby enemies and cause them to take damage over time. So there's all these different things. And you can control to an, a point which room you go to, but you can't control what shows up so you might want to have those lightning boons from zeus but what you might get is dionysus and Ares. you know you don't you don't know um actually you, you probably want Ares. Ares has got some good stuff it basically just makes you hit harder all the time which is good um but yeah so like as you go through these seven or eight rooms to kind of get up to the boss you want a specific strategy but you are not always presented with the strategy that you want uh and sometimes you say well, I really want that boon from Zeus in that room, but I am also at half health and I really should go to this next room, which is obviously Charon, the boatman, where I can go and buy some health and get back up to full health. So like there's these bits that are 
um, choices that you're kind of forced to make sometimes. And um, I get really mad when like you take a stupid hit or, or something happens where you step on like a spike trap that you didn't see and it takes you down to like two thirds health. And you're just like, crap, like I didn't need that now. <laughs> I, I know I can clear this room probably without getting hit at all. I just was sleepy and made a mistake. So that kind of stuff I do find unappealing. There is a God mode. You can go into the settings and uh, the way that Johnny explained it to me is that um, when you get defeated, it'll increase your defense by 10%. And so as you can, as you continue to die, it will slowly buff you to the point where you're strong enough where you can get through the level. And so okay. it, without, without any cost to you, it doesn't cost any in-game currency. It doesn't cost time. It just kind of says like, well, you failed at that. Let's make you a little bit stronger just by default and see if that helps. Because some people don't have a lot of time. They don't want to bash their head against the wall. They just want the story. I might reach that point. I've gotten Meg uh, down to like 20% health before. So like I'm really close to beating her. I think it might just take me longer than the average person. So I'm going to keep at it. And then if I run into other bosses that are just absolutely hell, then I, I might I might have to go with the um, with the God mode. Because... I don't enjoy punishing games and I really don't yeah. enjoy things. I don't enjoy th doing things over again. It's the same reason I don't build things in Minecraft in creative and then build them again in survival. Cause I'm, I'm <laughs> bored. Like I just, I've already done this. I don't need to do it again unless it's a technical thing I'm trying to sort out. So yeah. with this, like I don't want to run the entire length of the rooms in Tartarus again just to go fight the boss i know i can defeat all of those rooms but that's just the way that the game mechanics work um yeah. it's so it sounds I'm like again like i don't want to sound like i'm complaining about it i am thoroughly enjoying my time in the game uh it's just um a gameplay style a, a type of game that i'm not used to but it is it's beautiful it's such a, a a chef's kiss to art and art direction and like you said color uh, in a, in a mm. same, in a similar way to how Minecraft dungeons has brought a rainbow of color and lighting effects to dungeon crawlers, which are generally, you know, you're going into a tomb that's gray and dark and has candles on the walls and then everything attacking you is either like a gray zombie, a gray skeleton or some other black demon thing. And so in this, uh, you're like, because it's mythology, they've just, everybody is bright and colorful, you know? Um, yeah. Poseidon is turquoise, you know, Nyx, the, 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 who is the personification of night is like all purple and black and like, there's just some beautiful, beautiful design and, and color choices and stuff. So if nothing else, I'd encourage listeners to go look up some art from the game. Uh, I, I'm going to actually look to see if there's much on art station or seeing what else I can find around because it's just really inspiring stuff. Yeah. And I, I think that that gameplay mechanic that you were just mentioning as well is probably so in this is actually more enticing to me because I, I do know that when i was a kid uh when you've got all the time in the world playing games which are challenging is really good for me now it's just like i i don't want to just waste time i don't have as much time for games these days so being able to have something that just at least me, lets me enjoy the story and uh, and progress further without just hitting that brick wall that you'll never pass is is very appealing it is available on Switch as well as Xbox. Uh, I think it's twenty four ninety nine on Switch and Xbox. Ooh, nice. I don't remember what the cost of it was on Xbox, but of course I'm paying you know five six bucks a month with my Amazon mm. deal on on Xbox Game Pass. So like well worth it for me as well. But but certainly an affordable title for anybody that's looking for something a little bit different to pick up. Moving on to the Internet Minute, which is, of course, brought to you by you, dear listener. The Citadel Cafe is 100% listener supported. If you're getting value out of the show, please consider putting a little bit of value back in. You can become a member at patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. Joining at any level will get you an invite to the member only Discord server. There are multiple levels and different rewards like Discord roles and, of course, bonus audio episodes. Patron count is currently at 25. If you would like to be 26, then check out patreon.com slash the Citadel Cafe. What is your pick this week, my friend? Well, I think it would be a bit amiss for me to not mention Star Trek at some point today. Um, there's a Instagram account that's been around for a while that I did not actually know about. It's an official one called Star Trek Logs. 
And what they've done is they've taken some of the actors from the new Star Trek series like Discovery. And right now it's Lower Decks because that has just returned for season two. And they're having those characters provide a ship's log about some of the events that they've had. So you can kind of go watch the Lower Decks episode and then hear the first officer give his log of what happened in that and his feelings. And it's just a really nice tidbit and insight into those characters. Um, and I, I, it's been a pleasant surprise to kind of see it and just kind of go back through and just hear these logs from different characters. So definitely worth checking out if you're watching the, uh, the new shows. I have not yet seen the new show. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is when Star Trek returns, either for Picard or Discovery, I'll end up resubscribing to Crave, uh, mm. at which point I'll get access to Lower Decks as well. And uh, I did watch a couple of these on Instagram before the show, uh, specifically the captain's log, I think it was. He turned yeah. he turned into a, a, a head god or something. And I, the, the story of him going down to the surface and disliking the the, the number that this colony chose as the representation i just it was very funny like even even as a monologue it was it was pretty funny how, I, i'm yeah. curious how do you feel about the swearing in star trek even if they bleep it out like how do you feel about that uh, fine it's it's one of those things that swearing has been in star trek for a very long time picard swore in the next generation um we have had is i feel that it's just a little bit more prominent or it's almost highlighted more um you know like when you think of back to the future you don't really think about how much swearing is actually in that film um because the delivery it's a little bit more under the rug and can sometimes kind of pass you by whereas there's a lot more focus on the swear that's being used in the modern one so i i, I don't mind it and i think it does serve where things are at, especially it is modern storytelling and it's it's more realistic using that language in a way mm. um at times but i don't feel it's overused and i think that's the key thing um but it has always been a part of star trek um as infrequent as it may be so yeah i i, I don't mind it i think it's fine i like it in discovery because discovery yeah. i think has that grittier side yeah. Uh, and Strange New World, same with if they decide to be a little bit on the sweary side in that, I'd be fine with that too. It has a cowboy vibe to it, I think. <laughs> yeah. That could be just Anson yeah. Mount because I've seen him in other things. Um, mm. But in the cartoons, in the same way that I think it doesn't work as well for next generation stuff, cartoons feels lazy. It's like if you swear as a cartoon, all of a sudden, like, oh, you're not supposed to swear as a cartoon. That means we're an adult cartoon. So we get to swear. I feel like it's it's a lazy. I'd rather someone make something up, you know, make up some, I'd rather a really inventive, very like high vocabulary insult than just swearing at somebody in a cartoon. Um, and while I don't mind swearing in situations like the next generation or in Picard, I feel like because the show was on television for so long and there was no swearing in it, it's almost a novelty to hear it's like a cheap laugh in one of the next generation films if you see data swear like it's it's meant to be a funny moment it's not meant to be natural it's meant to be yeah. a joke uh and so that that i think is like and again there's nothing wrong with that i i think it fits well in that way but i think mm -hmm. that discovery is doing it the right way where they're just not calling attention to it it's used in a right moment you know where someone says oh shit you know because something bad yeah. is about to happen uh, <laughs> it's just that that kind of stuff i think works a lot better um but uh, i need to, i really need to get off my butt and watch lower decks i'm probably going to yeah. like it i just it's one of those things where all of those adult cartoons tend to look the same like it's right now anything that's new looks like a mesh between rick and morty and um family guy yeah it all just seems like god you couldn't come up with anything new like it just well, well this this is the thing that that's exactly how it looks at the beginning um not that the, the art style changes uh, at all but the the show is produced by one of the producers of rick and morty so it's understandable that it has a lot of that yeah. kind of vibe to it um but you start to realize as this the first season progresses 
there is so much more. Like that is just surface level stuff. It goes a lot deeper. The character development is there. There is a fantastic arc to the show that's actually really surprising. Season one ends in a very uplifting way. Um, you know that gets you really excited for for what could come later on. Um, it's it's a brilliant, brilliant show, and it is very mature. There there are some very mature themes throughout the first season where you realize like it is an adult comedy it is an adult cartoon an animation this one is not for kids really at all certainly not young children um but they do have that covered because we have star trek prodigy uh coming out as well which is the uh, 3d cg animated um show with kate mulgrew as captain janeway and just announced uh, Robert Beltran is going to be returning as Chicote uh, oh, nice. in there as well. So, yeah, and that, that's that's going to be aimed more at younger viewers. But at the same time, they've said don't underestimate the show based on that it is for younger viewers. They they said to, to do so would be uh, limiting yourself. So it's uh, apparently that's going to be a good one to to keep an eye out for too. And for those interested, season two of uh, Lower Decks is out now. Well, that wraps up this episode of The Citadel Cafe. You can find out more information about the show and some of the links that we talked about at thecitadelcafe.com. Music for the show was composed by Kevin McLeod. You can email the show at thecitadelcafe at gmail.com or find the show by name on Twitter. Subscribe for free on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, and Reason FM. Word of mouth is the easiest way to support the show. It's free. Just tell friends about The Citadel Cafe and where they can go to listen to it. I have seen an uptick in listeners over the last few weeks, and I very much appreciate it. Uh, that is working. So if you are enjoying the show, tell more people. Uh, I would love to have more ear holes on the podcast. My name is Joel Duggan. You can find everything I'm doing online, including my illustration and design portfolio at joelduggan.com. You can listen to my other podcast all about Minecraft at the spawnchunks.com. Teaser, Johnny is away this week on vacation, and I will be joined by a guest. Uh, you'll just have to wait to find out who that is. So we're going to chat on Monday on the Spawn Chunks. You can follow me at Joel Duggan on social media. And of course, I'll point you towards twitch.tv slash Joel Duggan, where I play Minecraft on the Citadel server, sometimes with Alistair. And I am playing a number of other games, including getting back into Satisfactory in my 430 hour save. Sometimes I question my life choices. <laughs> Dude, thanks so much for hanging out with me this morning. Where can people find you online? Yeah, everything I'm involved in online is at alistairmcfly.com. Uh, you'll find me on both Twitter and Twitch as Alistair McFly. And if you've experienced the final frontier and are looking to boldly go to a podcast you've never heard before, then why not check out my Star Trek retrospective series, Long Range Sensors, available on all the usual podcasting apps and at longrangesensors.com. You've been listening to the Citadel Cafe, where we are fast, easy, and cheap, but you can only pick two.